to English because we have a completely English speaker morning. I'm looking forward to the day today. Our first speaker is Professor Edsger W. Dijkstra. I think you all know him for his contributions, and it's not possible to mention all his contributions in 10 sentences, so I rather keep it short. Structured programming is certainly one thing for the software engineers, which is most important, but for people working in science, like myself, it's also important to mention his contribution to Algol in the early days, to recursion and implementation of recursion. Semaphores were already mentioned. Also, his work on operating systems. And then later, he became very interested in structured programming, also using techniques from logics, very famous weakest predicate transformers, and lots of work stimulated by that. So it's a big pleasure for us to have Etzke here. Etzke, please. Zero, one, two. If this had been a real test, I would have started one, two, three. Okay, it worked. <laughs> I hope all of you slept well. <laughs> the um, the Mark Orbiter of summer schools, uh, at an early stage, I was asked. Uh, when I would like to lecture, and I said, well, early in the school. Instead, they gave me the 9 o'clock slot each day. Um, uh, particularly the second week on Friday morning, that was after the farewell gala dinner. That particular lecture was nicknamed the victory of mind over matter. <laughs> Thank you. Well, here we go. Uh, this is not the title of my lecture. Uh, the title of the lecture is What Led to Notes on Structured Programming. Uh, all the slides you will see are SDNM's own version. Um, okay. Did I press twice? Yes. Yes. Uh, let's go through the history quickly. Uh, I was introduced to programming in uh, 1951 in a summer school given in Cambridge by Morris Wilkes, David Wheeler, and Stan Gill, and became a part time, on a part time basis, initially two days per week, the programmer of the Mathematical Center in Amsterdam. In the rest of the week, I was supposed to study theoretical physics. Now, my only model for programming was the programming organization as developed in um, Cambridge for the EdSec. I followed it closely when designing the program notation, input, output, and library organization for the machines that were being built at the Mathematical Center. That was the ARA first, and then the FERTA, then the ARMAC, and finally the X1. Uh, they would all follow the same pattern that I had learned uh, in Cambridge. I clearly was a conservative programmer. Uh, yes. Uh, when I joined the Mathematical Center in the spring of 1952, I was invited to do so by uh, Aad van Wijngaarden, who then became my boss. Uh, Bram Loopstra and Karel Scholten, I just mentioned them because they are the people with whom I cooperated most closely. Uh, I told you that I was studying theoretical physics and was, therefore was programming. Scholten and Loopstra, they studied 
uh, experimental physics, and they built the machines. Um, Yeah. Uh, the uh, I have too much, too many papers. No. Oh yes. Uh, the next important moment in, is, in, in my life was in 1955, when I decided to become a programmer. Um, I took that decision because I had concluded that of theoretical physics and programming, programming embodied the greater intellectual challenge. It's true, I, it's true, I did so. You see, in those days I did not suffer from intellectual modesty. But, but it was a difficult decision, for I had been groomed as first-class scientist, and becoming a programmer looked like a farewell from science. When I explained to Van Wijngaarden my dilemma, he told me that computers were here to stay, and that in the world of programming, I could very well be one of the purpose persons called to create the science that was still lacking. Getting my degree in physics in Leiden became a formality to be done with as quickly as possible. As a matter of fact, I no longer felt welcome in Leiden. The physicists considered me as a deserter, and the mathematicians one of whom openly prided himself on, of course, knowing nothing about computers, were just contemptuous. It was all finite, so it had to be trivial, you know. In the meantime, a pattern emerged. Yeah. Wait, sorry. In the meantime, a pattern emerged for the cooperation between me and my hardware colleagues, Lobster and Scholten. After the functional specification of the next machine had been written, usually by me, that document served as a kind of contract between us. It told them what machine to design and construct, while I knew what I could count on, while writing all the basic software for the machine. The target of this division of labor was that my programs would be ready by the time the construction of the machine had been completed. Looking back now, I observe that the above arrangement has had a profound influence on how I grew up as a programmer. I found it perfectly normal to program for a not yet existing machine. As a byproduct, it, it became firmly ingrained in my mind that I programmed for the abstract machine as specified in the original document and not for the actual piece of hardware. The original document was not a description but a prescription. And in the case of a discrepancy, not the text but the actual hardware would be at fault. At the time I regarded this division of labor and the resulting practice of programming for non-existing machines as perfectly normal. Later I read an American article on why software was always late. I remember being very amazed when I read that limited availability of the hardware was a main cause. And I concluded that the circumstances under which I had learned programming had been less common than I had assumed. Of course, I could not exclude from my designs typographical errors and similar blemishes, but such shortcomings did not matter as the machines were not ready yet. And after the completion of the machine, they could be readily identified as soon as they manifested themselves. 
But last comforting thought. Here we are. Was denied to me in 1957 with the introduction of the real time interrupt. Yes, those are the important things I did <laughs> in 1957. When Lofstra and Scholz suggested the real-time interact for the, for the X1, our next machine, I got visions of my program causing irreproducible errors, and I panicked. Eventually, Lofstra and Scholz flattered me out of my resistance, and I studied their proposal. The first thing I investigated was whether I could demonstrate that the machine state could be saved and restored in such a way that interrupted programs could be continued as if nothing had happened. I demonstrated instead that it could not be done, and my friends had to change their proposal. Admittedly, the scenarios under which the original proposal would fail were very unlikely. But this can have only strengthened my conviction that I had to rely on arguments rather than on experiments. At the time, that conviction, conviction was apparently not so widespread. For up to seven years later, I would find flaws in the interrupt hardware of new commercial machines. One of them was the IBM. 360, I was extremely cross uh, for the blunders that you could find in, uh, the in the design of the interrupt hardware of that machine because um, one of the designers, Jerry Blau, with, uh, should have known better because I had intensely cooperated with him in the design and the debugging of the Ferta in the early 50s. Okay, so that was 57. I don't remember what I did in 58. <laughs> I had a very illuminating experience in uh, 1959. Um, I posed to my colleagues at the Mathematical Center uh, the following problem. Consider two programs that can communicate via atomic reads and writes in a shared store. Can they be programmed in such a way that the execution, executions of their critical sections exclude each other in time? Uh, I made a competition out of that, and solutions came pouring in, but they were all wrong. So people tried more complicated solutions. Now, as they made their solutions more and more complicated, uh, their solutions required more and more elaborate counterexamples for their refutation, and I had to give up, um, and I had to change the rules. The rules became that besides the solution, they should hand in an argument why the solution was correct. And what then happened was very illuminating. Within a few hours, Dirk Decker handed in a true solution with its correctness argument. Decker had first analyzed the proof obligations, then chosen, chosen the shape of an argument that would meet them, and then constructed the program to which this argument was applicable. It was a very clear example of how much one loses when the role of mathematics is confined to a posteriori verification. And in 1968, I would publish a paper titled A Constructive Approach to the Problem of Program Correctness. But a seed for that was sown by Decker. Decker's experience. Uh, what's the name? Mm -hmm. no. Yes. 
Okay, here's next. Um, that was Article 60. We saw it coming in 1959 and implemented it in the first half of 1960. I was terribly afraid, for this implementation was then by far my most ambitious project. Article 60 was so far ahead of its time that even its designers did not know how to implement it. I had never written the compiler and had to achieve my goal with a machine that had only 4,096 words of storage. The word was 27 bits, not counting the parity bit. Okay, that way I had such a small storage that letter constraint was of course a blessing in disguise. But I don't remember it seeing that way when we started. By today's standards, we did not know what we were doing. We didn't dream of giving any guarantee that our implementation would be correct because we knew full well that we lacked the theoretical knowledge that would be needed for that. We did the only thing we could do under the circumstances, that is to keep our design as simple and systematic as we could and to check that we had avoided all the mistakes we could think of. Eventually we learned that we had made mistakes we had not thought of and after all the repairs, the compiler was no longer as clean as we had originally hoped. And as a matter of fact, Kruzeman Aretz still found and repaired a number of errors after I had left the mathematical center. I had an illuminating experience in 1962 in Rome. Uh, there was a conference and we were sitting in a, in a wrong room big circle talking about God knows what. And there was an American, uh, that, that was a time you should realize, 62, that people who had written uh, compilers, they were a type of demigods. And in a circle there were all those demigods sitting. And there was an American who was very proud of his achievement and he boasted that uh, he had constructed a algebraic compiler, well, algebraic translator was the name at the time, of um, 55,000 instructions. And immediately he was outdone by one of his compatriots who told proudly that he had done a uh, algebraic compiler of more than 80,000 instructions. And then Peter Nauer said, well, my algo compiler only took 5,500. And then I could outdo him and say, well, mine only took 2,700. The, pri the sign of the pride pointed in different directions at different sides of the Atlantic. Now, right from the start, we expected two very different types of errors. Writing errors whose repair is trivial and thinking errors that would send us back to the drawing board. And the distinction has helped us because one combats them by the different techniques. Sonnefeld and I combated the writing errors by coding together, each with his own text in front of him, claiming that we would write two identical books. When we were done, both our texts were punched independently, the two tapes were compared mechanically, and about two dozen discrepancies showed up. The thinking errors we had tried to prevent by convincing each other why the proposed section would work. In this reasoning, we would mainly discuss the workings of the compiler while the compiled program was treated as data. And this experience has been helpful for later as it made us accustomed to non-operational considerations of program texts. Now, the whole experience has made me sensitive to what later would be called modularization, or divide and rule, or abstraction. 
to the care with which interfaces have to be chosen, and to the potential scope of the programming challenge in general. It has heavily contributed, partly of course due to my own failure, to my subsequent opinion that creating confidence in the correctness of his design was the most important but hardest aspect of the programmer's task. In a program, in a world obsessed with speed, this was not always a universally popular notion. I remember from those days two design principles that have, me, have served me well ever since. And one is, before really embarking on a sizable project, in particular before starting the large investment of coding, try to kill the project. Try to demonstrate that it can't be done. And the second one is, start with the most difficult, most risky part first. The same thing we did with the um, Algol compiler. The first program was almost the empty block, something like begin, real, x, and. The second program we tested was a, a summation routine that was called with this term to be summed, a sum itself, so that we in this way we created the double summation. In addition, the, the, the summation routine itself was defined recursively, so you had all the mechanisms for nested calls. That was our fourth example. In passing, we had demonstrated the validity of what became known as Jensen's device. Check that. Yes, okay. Now, after this implementation interlude, I returned in fairly general terms to the still open problem of proper coordination of, in principle, asynchronous components. Without being directly involved, I had witnessed a few years earlier the efforts of coupling all sorts of punched card equipment to the X1, and I had been horrified by the degree of complication introduced by the inclusion of real-time commitments. Uh, Fred Brooks yesterday mentioned the uh, check sorter. Um, I have seen even worse proposals. For simplicity's sake, I therefore insisted on timeless design, the correctness of which could be established by discrete reasoning only. Now, almost unavoidably, the model of the cooperating sequential processes emerged. Where am I? Oh, yes. Yeah, sequential processes with, by definition, undefined relative speeds and hence, for the sake of their cooperation, equipped with some primitives for synchronization. Another opportunity for simplification was presented by the recognition that the timing aspects between a piece of communication equipment and the program that used it were completely symmetrical between the two and independent of whether we had an input or output device. This is just a producer-consumer relation, uh, no matter in which direction the information flowed. Now, needless to say, this unification helped a lot. Where are we? Oh, yes, 1965. Now, when we got involved in the design of the THC multiprogramming system, Scaling up slowly became a more and more explicit concern. It had to. Within IBM, and possibly elsewhere as well, circulated as a supposed law of nature that system complexity, in some informal sense, would grow as the square of the number of components. The reasoning behind it was simple. Each component could interfere with each other component, etc. But if this were a true law, 
it would de facto rule out systems beyond a certain size. Now this invoked my interest in systems structured in such a way that system complexity in the same informal sense would not grow more than linearly with the size of the system designed. And in 1967, the expression layers of abstraction entered the computer lingo. Let me close the discussion of this episode by quoting the last two sentences of EWD 123, Cooperating Sequential Processes. I quote, If this monograph gives any reader a clearer indication of what kind of hierarchical ordering can be expected to be relevant, I have reached one of my dearest goals. And maybe not hope, that the confrontation with the intricacies of multiprogramming gives us a clearer understanding of what uniprogramming is all about. End of quotation. Yes. In 1968, I suffered from a deep depression, partly caused by the, departments, by the department, which did not accept informatics as relevant to its calling, and disbanded the group I had built up, and partly caused by my own hesitation what to do next. I knew that in retrospect, the algorithm implementation of the THC multiprogramming system had only been agility exercises, and that now I had to tackle the real problem of how to do difficult things. In my depressed state, it took me months to gather the courage to write for therapeutic reasons, EWD 249, Notes on Structured Programming, August 1968. Yeah. It marked the beginning of my recovery. It tries to synthesize the above mentioned ingredients of the preceding decade. It mentions on an early page the program structure in connection with the convincing demonstration of the correctness of the program. Mentions as their mental aids, enumeration, mathematical induction and abstraction. And for about the first and the last, I quote, enumer I quote from page 14 of the document, enumerative reasoning is all right as far as it goes, but as we are rather slow with it, it doesn't go very far. Enumerative reasoning is only an adequate mental tool under the severe boundary condition that we only use it very moderately. We should appreciate abstraction as our main mental technique to reduce the demands made upon enumerative reasoning. I had had two external stimuli. In 1968, a NATO conference in Garmisch Partenkirchen on software engineering, and the founding of the IFIP working group on programming method, WG 2.3, on programming methodology. I remember the uh, Garmisch Partenkirchen conference organized by F.L. Bauer as one of the most exciting moments in my life. I had been waiting for that for at least five and perhaps ten years. Uh, because this was the first time that I noticed a large group of people from all sorts of places, each of them so high in their local hierarchy that they could afford to be honest. And. Uh, At last it was openly admitted that uh, programming was very difficult. And that, of course, was a condition uh, that something, to get activity, that something would be done about it. Yeah, thank
thanks to the ubiquitous Xerox machine, my typewritten text could spread like wildfire. And it did so probably because people found it refreshing in the prevailing culture characterized by the 1968 IBM advertisement in Datamation. I don't, know, I don't think you will remember it, but uh, that advertisement presented in full color a beaming Susie Meyer who had solved all her programming problems, quote, by switching to PL1, unquote. Apparently, IBM did not the, like the popularity of my text. It stole the term structured programming and under auspices of Harlan D. Mills, trivialized the original concept to the abolishment of the go-to statement. Looking back, I cannot fail to observe my fear of formal mathematics at the time. In 1970, I had spent more than a decade hoping and then arguing that programming would be and should become a mathematical activity. I had rearranged the programming task so as to make it better amenable to mathematical treatment, but carefully avoided creating the required mathematics myself. I had to wait for Bob Floyd who laid the foundation, for Jim King who showed me the first example that convinced me, and for Tony Hoare who showed how semantics could be defined in terms of axioms needed for the proofs of properties of programs. And then I didn't see the significance of their work immediately. I was really slow. Okay, finally, a short story for the record. In 1968, the communications of the ACM published a text of mine under the title, The Go-To Statement Considered Harmful, which in later years would be the most frequently referenced, regret, yeah? Which in later years would be most frequently referenced. Regrettably, however, often by authors who had seen no more than its title. The title became a cornerstone of my fame by becoming a template. You could see all sorts of articles under the title X considered harmful for almost any X, <laughs> including one titled Dextra considered harmful. <laughs> but what had happened? I had submitted the paper under the title A Case Against the Go-To Statement. And assume it was written under the assumption that everybody knew that the go-to statement was a, a combinatorial complexity generator. Uh, I had, among other other among others, said so in 1965 at the IFIP conference in New York. Um, even then, I didn't expect the thing to be new. But the point of the paper is the exp explanation. Why it creates complexity. So that was the case against the go-to statement. The paper which, in order to speed up its publication, the editor had changed into a letter to the editor. And in the process, he had given it a new title of his own invention. The editor was Niklaus Bicht. <laughs> <laughs> 